Well, and I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Jerry. I live in Hardwick. Anybody ever been to Hardwick before? Um, I'm not a Vermonter, you can tell by the way I talk. I'm a Midwesterner. I, live, I grew up in Ohio. Anybody ever been to Ohio? Uh, I taught high school there for a while, and then I moved out west to a big state called Montana. Anybody ever been to Montana? <coughs> okay. Um, been, in, been in Hardwick for 27 years. Um, been doing programs like this, butterflies, pollinators, bats, for 23 years. Um, and I always start my bat program by asking people what they know about bats. <clears throat> We're going to talk about a lot of things about bats, but uh, just want to get a feel about for what you know. Uh, so, like, what's one thing you know about bats? Yes. Mammals. They're mammals. There are only flying mammals, right? Yes. Eat insects. They eat insects. Yeah. Our bats eat insects. We have bats out west that are nectaring bats. Um, we have fruit bats all over the world, but in New England, our bats eat insects. Um, a little brown bat can eat up to a thousand mosquitoes in one night. Um, they can eat dozens of beetles, which uh, help farmers. Um, they can eat moths. What else do we know about bats? Nocturnal. They're nocturnal, so uh, they're active in the evening and night, and they, uh, they rest and sleep during the day. Anybody know about how they navigate? Is there sonar. Something? And I'm a sonar, yeah. They're emitting frequencies constantly. When you see a bat flying, it's constantly emitting, I'm going to turn this off. Uh, it's constantly emitting frequencies that are too high for us to hear. Um, and if we could hear them, they would be almost as loud as a fire alarm. Um, mm. But we can't hear them because their pitch is too high. Um, our ears, they measure frequency, uh, sound frequencies in kilohertz, and our ears can pick up uh, sounds up to about 18 kilohertz. As we get older, like into our 60s and 70s, that number goes down. So if you're in your 60s, it could be like more like, instead of 18, it could be 17 or 16. If you're in your 70s and 80s, and it goes down even farther. Um, so that's why we can't hear bats, because their pitch is too high. Um, um, the little brown bat has <coughs> a frequency of somewhere between 26 and 35 kilohertz. Uh, and of course, humans are curious, right? We want to know. Um, so we wanted to know what do those bats sound like? So somebody invented a thing called a bat detector. And uh, the bat detector will, don't ask me how, I'm not a scientist or an engineer, but the bat detector will slow down the frequencies through some kind of mechanism, and then we can hear frequencies slow enough for us to hear. So um, when there used to be a lot of bats, remember that? <laughs> um, I would go to neighborhood parties, and I would take my bat detector, and if I saw, mostly they were little brown bats, that was our most common bat, um, <clears throat> I would turn on the volume and dial this to somewhere between 26 and 35, and I, lo and behold, I would land, we would land on the sound of the bat echolocating, and it would sound like our little brown bats and our big brown bats make a clicking sound. Some bats will make a bird kind of sound, a chirping sound. Um, so we would hear through the bat detector something like this. In real life, it's a lot faster and higher pitch than we can hear. So by doing that, bats navigate without bumping into things. They can see as well as us. Bats are not blind. Uh, but imagine yourself flying at 40, 45 miles an hour at night with our eyesight, you would bump into things. So, um, so bats use echolocation calls to help them navigate so they can pick up instantly um, a wall, tree limb, <clears throat> moth flying by. So it's a pretty, pretty amazing thing that they can do with that echolocation calls. Um, let's look at a bat. By the way, these are a few things in here that bats eat. The things that are either either nocturnal or does anybody know that big word that's, that describes the time of day uh, just before sunrise or just before night? It starts with a CR. What was that? Crepuscular. Crepuscular, yes. So um, these are the creatures that are crepuscular or nocturnal in here are would be bat food. Um, 
Let's take a look at this little brown bat. It has a wingspan of 8 to 10 inches. Used to be our most common bat, but with the white nose syndrome, uh, which devastated millions of these this species of bat, um, it's no longer our largest, um, our most common bat. Are lightning bugs um, on their menu? Yes, oh. lightning bugs are beetles, and so, yeah, and they're on their menu, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, the big brown bat is now our most common bat, which has a wingspan of 12 to 16 inches, so it'd be probably a little bit bigger than this frame. Um, how much do you think a little brown bat would weigh? And we're talking ounces because they have hollow wings and they're very light. You want to take a guess at how many ounces a little brown bat would weigh? Don't be afraid to be wrong. Two, okay. two ounces. When I have kids, there, they're always <laughs> two, ounces. two ounces. Two ounces. Yes. Anybody else want to take a guess? Six. Six ounces. Anybody over here want to take a guess? The big brown bat has, weighs one ounce. Wow. Um, <clears throat> the little brown bat, one fifth of an ounce. Wow. So about two pennies. Um, our smallest bat, the bubblebee bat, which you'll see a slide of, is half the size of this, so it probably weighs one penny. Um, how old do you think um, little brown bats get to be in their lifetime? Another question. How many years? Eight. Eight. Anybody else want to take a guess? Five. Five. Anybody over here? <laughs> <laughs> These risk takers. Yeah. We have a couple of them. Twelve. <laughs> Twelve? Okay. Um, you're thinking very logistically. Mammals this size typically would live to be maybe three to eight years old. Not much longer than that. But uh, bats have a special thing in their genes that keeps them living longer. Um, this bat can live up to 35 years. Wow. Um, a lot of our other bats live 20 to 25 years. Huh. And then the final question, I'll put you on the spot one more time. Um, or maybe not. Um, what are the babies called? I've read in books, fictional books, they call them batlings in some of the stories, and I prefer that. But that's not what they're, that's not what they're called. Okay, no. yeah. Pups. pups, right. How many pups do you think a mama bat has in one year? More questions. One. 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 So when our bat populations go down, <clears throat> either because we take away their habitat, the biggest factor in the last 15 years has been the white nose syndrome, um, which has infected caves, started in New Hampshire and has moved west. Is still um, affecting bats. It has killed millions of bats. Um, what the white nose syndrome? Does anybody know what white nose syndrome does? How that affects bats? So um, it keeps it makes their wings a little brittle, but the big thing is it keeps them from hibernating. So it wakes them up during hibernation. Has mm -hmm. anybody ever been to the Dorset Cave, um, Dorset, Vermont? It, it's our biggest cave for bats hibernating. And bats from all over New England go to that cave. <clears throat> At one point, there were more than 50,000 bats in that cave. And because of white nose syndrome, it, it, it went under a few hundred. Um, so it killed off a lot of bats. And so if, if it's waking them up, uh, then out of their hibernation, then their metabolism raises, rises. They have to, you know, they have to eat more because they're losing their energy more. So, so they fly out of their cave and it's January and then they freeze. So that's, that was basically the story of, of the bats in caves having white nose syndrome. Some would get, some they call fat bats, would eat more for some reason. Um, they were just lucky. They got, maybe they had a couple moths right before they went into hibernation or something. And they were able to withstand, wake up a few times, go back to sleep and still make it through the winter. And, um, they're, uh, they're cleaning out more caves, um, trying to get rid of the fungus, um, but it's going to take a long time for bats to come back to what, what we used to see 15, 20 years ago, because they only have one pup a year. Is anybody seeing more bats? Um, some. I mean, some is better than what you probably saw five, ten years ago. Um, so they are making a little bit of a comeback, but again, if they only have one puppy a year. It's not like the monarch butterfly that lays 500 to 800 eggs. So if monarch populations are down, 
and the conditions are right, they can bounce right back, but that's it's going to take a while. And that's if the conditions are right. And that, as we may know, um, that's not the case. Um, we're, kind of, we're constantly battling uh, the environment and, and things that disrupt um, environment, uh, clean environment. So, <clears throat> yes. So, uh, what are some things we can do to help bats? Anybody know? Yes. So you had a bat house there, so you more. We can bat have a bat house, house, and that would provide that would provide a residence for maternal bats. That's, most of the maternal colonies take up residency in the bats or in your attic, and they're having their pups. Um, so, but that's this is Jim's bat house, and um, Jim mentioned to me that he has made a few bat houses, and he's put them up. And he hasn't had any bats yet. And I told him that's because bats are very loyal to their roosts. So when they come out of hibernation in April or May, they're going back to the same place they've always gone back to. Um, so they, yes. So these bat houses are for their summer use when they're not in hibernation. Right. And then they, they will tend to go to a, yes. another place to hibernate. Yeah, and I have one here. <clears throat> Jim has four different um, compartments. And mine has one big compartment. This can hold about 60 little brown bats. Um, and if you decide to put up a bat house, I always tell people don't hold your breath, but there may be a case where a bat's habitat has been taken, trees have been cut down and just looking for a new place and they may find ticket residency. Got a wire mesh and so does that one. Um, <clears throat> you want to put it at least 10 feet high so they feel safe from predators. You want to put it facing south or east because it is the mama bats and, and pups in the, in the house, and the pups are, you know, they need a lot of heat. Um, and then you want to paint it um, the color. Don't ask me how bats know that they have a certain color, or praying mantises, or whatever. But they, you know, they want to cam camouflage. So if you paint it brown or black, it has a better chance of them going into it. Could you explain that mesh again? Where this is a wire there? mesh, yes. And um, it goes up into the box, and that's so the bats can grab onto something, because oh, otherwise see. it's kind of slippery I in there. Okay. And uh, this is pretty smooth wood, so the wire mesh goes all the way up. Perhaps in your, in your bat house, they, it may be a little rougher. Inside it's a uh, rough uh, cedar. Yeah. So it's pretty good for Yeah, them. so they can hang on. A question on the uh, uh, positioning of the house. Cold south is not too hot. Good question. I don't know. Cold, cold sun. I mean, there's this one has a a gap here for ventilation. So, and probably there's some gap. Yeah, there's a gap up on the top too, all right. the way around. So yeah, mine has gaps as well. Yeah. So um, I'm not an expert on that question. Okay. Um, I mean, I was told that south facing because it's keeps warm, but um, who knows, um, a lot of, uh, I've seen bat houses that are in trees, so they are getting some shade mm -hmm. and some sun, um, but you might want to research more of that if you build a bat house. Okay, so white nose syndrome has killed a lot of bats. Um, if we take away their habitat, that hurts bats. <clears throat> um, if you want to help bats, I tell people, if you want to help bats, we have to be more wild. And then people go, oh, what does that mean? Like more mosquitoes? Yeah, more bugs? Yeah. So um, if you want to see wild, you have to be wild. Um, my wife and I, we let one third of our yard go. We don't mow. Um, <clears throat> and we just generate bugs. Um, we do get bats. Um, we also get more birds because they eat the insects. So, Generally um, speaking, if you let things go, um, you know, this whole phenomenon of neat lawns, manicured lawns, um, has been around only for a couple hundred years. Um, well, some of the wealthy in Europe would do that, but, um, and they're just now realizing that if you let things grow, they also absorb carbon. Um, there was an article in, two days ago in the New York Times about corporations, it was in the business section, about corporations that <clears throat> Hewlett Packard and other places that are totally transforming their landscapes 
they're not mowing, they don't have these manicured emerald lawns that go on forever around their properties. They're letting them go wild and you know, doing natural grasses. Um, for one thing, the grasses absorb the carbon. Another thing, if they don't mow, they're not running their lawn equipment that takes gasoline. So, um, so those are all important things uh, in general for our environment, but as far as bats go, if you let things go a little bit, it'll generate more bugs, and that's good for bats. All right, we're gonna, um, moths also, they're related to bats in this program because bats are pollinators, uh, not our bats, our bats are insect they use, but a lot of bats are pollinators, and so are moths, and they both um, <coughs> pollinate night blooming flowers. So um, I'm gonna do a slideshow, and um, <coughs> when I do this with kids, Nobody knows what these are. <laughs> and they never will see it again because nobody uses this. But uh, these are slides, and of course, you know that the slide goes through, the light goes through the slide on the screen, and that's how we get our image. Um, I was a substitute teacher for 10 years in Hardwick, in elementary school. And um, every time we had an assembly, this was back about 15 years ago, um, 20 years ago maybe. It was right when PowerPoint was coming out, so I don't know if it's changed, it might have gotten better. But back then, every time they would do these PowerPoint presentations at the assembly, something would go wrong, and then they'd have to bring in the maintenance person, the IT person. It would take sometimes 10, 15 minutes to get it fixed, and the teacher would like, what do we do with these kids for 15 minutes? Um, so, I use the old-fashioned projector because sometimes I do three shows in a day, and I have to go from one library fairly quickly to the next. So I relied on the old-fashioned codec projector. Um, we're going to see the slideshow, and then we'll have questions after that. Um, there are no kids here, so we're not going to do the teacher craft. Um, we'll do that with kids usually, um, unless you want to. <laughs> if you want to, um, the the thing is, I have youth size shirts, but I have but I have a couple adult shirts, and I have a couple extra large that could would be like a medium adult. So I, we could do the shirts. It's really fun. So if we want to do shirts, we can do shirts. Um, Okay, let's do the slideshow first. Do you want me to get the live screen? Yes, please. <laughs> we move this fairly closely to the, uh, to the screen because we do have a lot of light coming in. But I think this will work. So these are perfect. These are slides, pictures, photos that were taken by a guy named Merlin Tuttle, who is the president of, used to be the president of Bat Conservation International in Austin, Texas. It's an organization that um, is an educational organization that informs people about bats and, um, and also does a lot of research and uh, does a lot of work in the tropics, um, helping bats populations. And uh, this is a Mexican long tongue bat, and uh, bats are pollinators in many areas, and you can see the pollen all over its face. So this bat was going after flower after flower, going after the nectar, the juice, and picking up pollen and pollinating flowers. This is a leaf-nosed bat, and uh, this is out in either Arizona or New Mexico or Texas. Uh, probably, if the organization is in Austin, it's probably in Texas. Uh, this is a saguaro cactus flower that blooms at night and relies on bats and moths for pollination. <coughs> you can see that this is a flying fox. Some of our biggest bats are flying foxes. They can, they can have wingspans three, four, five feet. Um, so do they hover like a hummingbird? They hover, yes. Huh. They hover like a hummingbird, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> or they grab on. Uh, I think some of the bigger bats just kind of probably hold on. So it, this is a fox? This is a flying fox. It's a bat. Oh. It's, called a, it's called a flying fox. <coughs> right. Yeah, type of bat. Most, a lot of our flying foxes are found in the tropics. Um, Thailand has the largest silverhead flying fox, which has a wingspan between five and six feet. Um, hmm. It also has the smallest bat, the bumblebee bat, which has a wingspan of about four inches. Um, this is a southern blossom bat. Most of our bats, all of our bats, have small eyes and rely on echolocation calls. Some bats have emerged or evolved to have larger eyes, and they can use those eyes to see. 
some bats have evolved to have big ears and they can hear uh, predators. And you'll we'll see a couple of those bats. This is a bat negotiating a fig. If this fig drops straight down, the, uh, it doesn't have a chance to grow because the limbs of the tree will keep out the rain and the sunshine, but uh, the bat uh, will take the fig, eat part of it, drop it, and then we have, it has a chance to grow. This is a silver-haired flying fox um, eating a mango, taking a mango. Here are some flying foxes. Uh, a couple of them are interested in the photographer, which is like in the middle. Um, they hang out during the day. Um, they don't always sleep, they just rest sometimes, just like cats. <laughs> Smallest bat in the world, a bumblebee bat. It weighs about one penny. Uh, some of our big bats can weigh uh, a few pounds. We have bats that skim the water and will actually dive into the water. This fisher bat will do that. It also eats uh, amphibians. Um, notice uh, a lot of our echolocators have gaps in their teeth, and that allows the sounds uh, to go out more efficiently. This is this bat. You can see the gaps in its front teeth. Is it a Michael Tyson bat? <laughs> Michael Tyson bat. <laughs> <laughs> Big brown bat, which is our most common bat now in the Northeast. This is, uh, so the bat is using echolocation calls, and uh, as they get closer and closer to an object like the moth, they'll increase the velocity of their bat calls and really hone in on it. Some will scoop, they will scoop um, insects up with their wings or they'll just attack them with their mouths. Um, <clears throat> this is a northern long-eared bat, which is a bat that we have in Vermont. <clears throat> it's always been uh, a bat that's not very common, but with the white nose syndrome, it's lost 99% of its population. And that is a Katydid that is eating. There's some Pallet bat is found out west. You go to New Mexico, California, Texas, Arizona, you find a pallet bat using those big ears. Also, the towns of this big ear bat. This is a towns of big ear bat. Um, wings of the bat are like our hand. You see the fingers and the thumb. The uh, order of bats is called Chiroptera. Whenever you hear the word Optera means wings, and Chiro means hand. So that's our like, order of handling. <clears throat> Here are a colony of pallet bats. Um, I'm not allowed to have a live bat because they're wild creatures, and if I had a live bat, uh, for one thing, I'm not nocturnal, but also um, it would not be happy in captivity. So I, did, I did a program in Hershey, Pennsylvania one time, they had a little zoo next to the library, near the library, so somebody from the zoo brought a bat over. And, uh, but then took it back in, into its colony that was looking at that. So, so we're looking up at a ceiling? Uh, yes, we're looking at a, yeah, it looks like. Um, it looks like the camera is it's probably up in a little, <clears throat> some kind of niche. How's the big, bigger bat looking at a Sunfi? How about that? Looking at a beetle. So we have two slides left there of the vampire bat. Vampire bats are different than other bats in that they use their legs more. Um, if, you, if the bat fell off its perch, it would have a hard time walking. They're not used to using their legs to walk. But vampire bats live off the backs of animals. They don't suck blood like the vampire movies. They will. They have sharp teeth. They scrape the skin of a horse or a cow or a pig uh, or a chicken, and they will lap the blood up like a cat. They have something that's lighter that numbs the skin so the animal doesn't feel it. And they have something that keeps the blood flowing a little bit. Uh, they take about one or two teaspoons an evening, so not hurting the animals as far as loss of blood. Um, they can run up to eight miles an hour. Um, the other name that I give the vampire bat is the disco bat. <coughs> the 
because of this picture here. This is an apple. <laughs> Some people say they can do cartwheels. Where are the wings in that photograph? What's that? Where are the wings? The, the wings are, yeah. So it's got its wings folded. So all up in here is folded its wings. So these would open up when it wants to fly. You don't need the wings when you're, you know, I mean, that's the thing that vampire bats probably do more than other bats because they don't need those wings when they're, when they're on the bat. They're not going after insects. You know, they're not flying after their prey, so. <coughs> and the last slide is the vampire bat. Taking blood from, I'm imagining this is a chicken, but it could be something like an ostrich. It's pretty big. The vampire bat is, is about the same size as our uh, little brown bats. So it's, it's attacking the foot? Or? Yes, the claw. It scrapes some of the claw and, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the end of our slideshow. So the name vampire, did that come from folklore? Um, I mean, was Dracula first before they named the vampire bat or the other way around? <laughs> Or are you going to suggest That's a good Google question. It? That's another good question that I haven't really... I think I tried looking that up at one point and I never got to the answer. Um, what came first, the, the movie or the bat? Um, I'm assuming... How far do you think the movie, vampire character, goes back? Well, movies are only in the, you know, the 20th century, right. but stories, <laughs> but there's books. Because I know that, what's, I mean, a, what's a scientific name? Does it have a vampire in it? Uh, I don't know the scientific name for the vampire bat. Um, look that up, that's a good question. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, do the same. Yeah, because, um, yeah, if the, if the literature came out, let's say, 1700s, <laughs> Um, people were classifying before that. I mean, there were a lot of, especially the, the British, did a lot of classifications. When they came over to the United States, they classified all the butterfly populations. So they were classifying quite a long time ago. Um, yeah, so I wonder if the Latin for, that they took for vampire has anything to do with blood. Another good question I can look up. Yes. Anybody know? <laughs> We're looking at Okay. Oh, good. Great. 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 Yeah, I mean, that, I think that Latin name um, probably refers to leaf names. Um, so that's not answering the question. Well, we both have homework now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thanks. This is probably why I didn't get the answer. It's not, a, it's not readily available. <laughs> I was wondering about predators and whether owls or they were nighttime mm -hmm. predators. Owls are the main predators of bats. Um, snakes. Um, How do snakes happen? Yeah. Snakes oh, snakes. crawl up. Snakes nice. are pretty tricky. Um, I mean, if, uh, if you know, they can they can climb up to where the bat is roosting during the day. Um, if a bat falls off its perch, then it's easy prey for a lot of animals. And are the babies to stay in the? Where they're sleeping. So uh, the babies, um, they nurse <clears throat> until about six weeks, I think it is, six to eight weeks. Then they can fly on their own. Um, I tell people if you're if you have bats in your attic <clears throat> and you want to close off the exit hole, um, you want to wait till about August um, to make sure that <clears throat> the babies have 
have taken off with the moths. But the babies, do they fly? Are they still connected to the mother when they? Um, <clears throat> when they're not flying on their own, they are connected to the mother. They're holding on to the mother. Um, yep. But otherwise, they're staying in the bat house or wherever they are. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're staying in the attic or wherever. Um, but most of the time, they're with the mother. Yeah. They hang on with their legs, and this is a. Uh, Sounds painful, but they they hold on. They, they bite the, the tate and hold on that way. And the mom's flies. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like mom's Um, uh, how do you bats know whether what they're approaching is a moth or a tree? <clears throat> they probably know because they probably know. Maybe as a baby, this is, this is just <clears throat> surmising. As a baby, maybe they've learned um, from the mamas, you know, from, from echolocation calls once they've developed it. Maybe they've learned that when something is fluttering, uh, the mama eats it. Is there a different echolocation sound for... There are different sounds for communication. So when, they're, when there's a whole lot of bats fluttering around, for instance, when they go into hibernation, they all get together and flutter around. <laughs> And then they're, you know, so they all bump into each other, they're communicating. But then there's a, another communication, uh, echolocation call for locating um, either trees, limbs, walls, and fluttering insects. Yeah, those are good questions. Kids don't ask those kind of questions. <laughs> so I get, I get to learn more when I have my dog in. So bats don't make nests of any sort? No, nope, they don't make nests. So we talked about being in attics. Where's the other place they are when they're... They could be in trees. They could be on... If you have loose clapboards on the side of your house, under umbrellas... Um, I think mine is in a louvered bed. A louvered bed at the... Uh-huh. Any place where they can have tight spaces they can get into. <clears throat> I've also found them on, on a upper barn door yep. that was closed and mm -hmm. when I opened it there was a little space. Yeah, there. I mean they also, I mean I've seen bats hanging out in, in I was, uh, I've, I've spent some time in Nicaragua and I've, I've seen bats just hanging on a wall pretty high up, but not enclosed anywhere but just hanging up. And I actually got maybe bit by a bat <laughs> once because I was taking a shade cloth off of the greenhouse that's, that was dark, yep. and I felt a little nip, and I thought it was a wasp oh. um, when I gathered it up in my arms, and then, but then when I put it on the ground to fold it up, a bat fell. Oh, um, so you might have gotten bit. And I, did, I, don't, I don't think he was sick. I think he was a healthy bat. I just smooshed him when I... Well, he didn't have rabies. Went. We know that. Right. Well, I called the rabies hotline, and they said, oh, you've got to have the shots. Oh, so they you, insisted, you got the shot. and yeah. so I did go through, which okay. wasn't painful. It was um, okay. just a, a week-long yeah. series of painful shots, but yeah. they they were pretty adamant. Okay. They did not want me to be yeah. the first case of Yeah, of all the bats that are brought in thinking they have rabies, um, they may be fluttering, they may be stumbling around on the ground, and they look sick, but they just don't use their legs. Um, about eight or nine percent actually have carried the disease. So raccoons carry it more than bats. Um, but you got to watch out because yeah, they do carry it. How how do they get rabies? It's another good question. That I don't know. Um, I don't know how they how they pick up rabies. Because I think don't you have to be bitten and get the saliva of an infected animal into you? I think it so. seems that way. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So they must be bitten by predators that carry rabies. And survive. And survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is true that you do not want to get bitten by a bat. You don't want to get bitten by a bat. If you can help it, don't get bitten by a bat. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Use, I mean, if you're handling, if you have a bat in your house, um, maybe 10 years ago we had bat in our bedroom, <clears throat> and it was flying around the light. Circling, it was nighttime. Um, it must have come down, we had a little hole about that big in our in the ceiling, and it must have come down through the attic. So 
I basically opened the window. I wasn't afraid of the bat because I didn't think it was going to do anything. Um, opened the window, bat's circling above me. Um, told my wife to go outside with a flashlight and then shut the light off and the bat followed the light. That's how we took care of it. I also have butterfly nets, so I can do that too. What do you think it's during the day? I had an experience in college, but I think my friend's cat had already named it a little bit. Mm. But I don't know how we would have caught it during the day because it wouldn't fly, right? No, they can see. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so it was maimed, so yeah, yeah right. in that case, try to call um, maybe a real rehabilitation. I mean, in Vermont, you'd probably call it VINs because they rehabilitate. <coughs> maybe there may be people in the area, in this area, that rehabilitate birds or animals. Yes? When bats are pursuing flying insects, do they echolocate on yes. a single <coughs> flying? They're constantly echolocating. So they can echolocate on a mosquito? And um, usually it's a swarm. It up? You know, usually they go where there's a lot of mosquitoes. Um, so they can open up. And yeah. You know, like around water where there's a lot of hatches, uh, including mosquitoes. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you want to say anything else about your bat house? Um, no, it's made of cedar, and I followed the regulations of the International Bat Association. Okay. And Is that the same one, Bat Conservation International? Yes. Yes. And fairly basic carpenter. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <clears throat> um, this white nose disease, um, how far has it spread? Far it's gone out to western states by now. Um, uh, it's to <clears throat> other countries? Uh, not that I know of. Um, they did have it in Europe a long time ago, and that's eventually over, over many years recovered. Uh, but it takes a long time. Um, it affects bats that um, like damper caves. Uh, some bats lose more water when they're hibernating, and so bats like the little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, they lose more water, so they tend to gravitate towards damper caves, and that's where the fungus grows. Whereas the big brown bat wasn't affected very much at all because it hibernates in drier. It doesn't lose as much water, so it hibernates in drier caves or in attics during the winter. <coughs> and that started in New Hampshire? It started in New Hampshire um, about 15 years ago. And then they wake up in the middle of the night and that's what was They wake night. up during hibernation when they're hibernating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And <coughs> it wakes them up, so their metabolism increases because in hibernation it goes way down so they can get through the winter. They use up more fuel, energy, and then they have to eat, so they fly out looking for food, and it's January, so they, they, you know, you'll see a lot of, people were recording a lot of bats that were dead right outside wherever they were hibernating. hibernating. So, so does their respiratory system get sort of uh, cut off from the sleeping, not let like sleep back in? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe it itches? You know, it's, it's, a, it's it, it makes their wings brittle. <clears throat> they can still fly, but so it probably does something where it's, <clears throat> it would be like if you were sleeping and all of a sudden you had something with your arm, uh, some kind of ache or stiffness in your arm, and then you roll over, you'd probably wake up because of that. Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, aches and pains, yeah. <clears throat> So once you have in your little plastic thing there, you just want to Oh, this is, yeah, um, this is my friend Taco. He's a Mexican, <clears throat> uh, he's a Mexican, what is he, uh, long-haired, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> long-haired tarantula. And I, I bring him because, uh, mainly because tarantulas are set kind of like bats. They don't get the respect they deserve. They're sort of like, <laughs> people don't take kindly to them. And so, uh, yeah. And so I, I usually have kids touch him and just get more familiar with him. Uh, and, you know, one of the aims of the bat program is to try to get people more familiar with bats so they're not so afraid of bats. And 
Same with taco. Yeah. 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 What is? Yeah. I guess two things. One is I used to work for a power company. Yeah. And uh, we always would have bats roosting on the things in the power transformers and subdivisions. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and the other thing is, I heard that there were some moths that could like jam the radar in the back and confuse the, <clears throat> their radar so they could get away. I haven't heard that, but it could be true. Yeah, it could be true. No, I don't know how they would do that. Um, yeah, I've never heard that before. That's, that's the first time I've heard that. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, if you're not doing the t-shirt craft, then the program is over. Thanks for being a great audience. <laughs>